e-learning, right? Um, content and go in, learn. Then you move on to a flip class. And the flip class generally handled by an instructor. This is a situation that could be 30 lecture hall type of 100 people lock in in an instructor, instructor-led flip class environment. Generally, given that type of knowledge dissemination session, um, it would not be possible for each individual to essentially practice to get that skill. We always divide them into, into small groups. So a 25 people class can be divided into five people in each group. Then they go into a group mentoring. And after group mentoring, they could be going to a lab, do the assignment at home, work on a real life project. So when they face problem, they might need a one-to-one -one support to actually execute that project. So if the project is executed, then clearly we deliver um, the type of outcome that we intended to. So going through that journey, so it's really becoming quite a complex journey. If you, if you look at the, the journey itself, we have an instructor handling about 30 people. We have six mentors along the way that mentor each of the small group. Then this mentor will follow through on a one-to-one -one mentoring. So we have seven, six, seven people involved. And clearly, and they, are, they can be in different places. They can be in the classroom, uh, they can be at home, they can be at work, and the journey can never be seen from a traditional conventional classroom learning that you could see all the activities going on. And particularly challenging given the collaborative nature of the learning. So what we need to do is to have, a, so we create a new role called learning facilitation. So this learning facilitation would be almost like the trip um, the customer relationship manager or a, a, a facilitator that tie together the seven uh, trainer and make sure that they actually uh, bring together a cohesive uh, journey for the learner to achieve the outcome that they want. So to do that, we bring together a combination of different technology. The first is that obviously the LMS, the learning management system. So we use edX. EDX. And after edX, when we do instructor-led live, uh, we use WebEx. And when we go from WebEx into the small group mentoring, obviously it depends on really how big that class is. If it's quite a big class with hundred, few hundred people, we essentially break them into small group class, right? It's almost like the usual face-to-face -face learning that you have the lecturer, the, the instructor walking around into different group, yet the small group could actually discuss among yourself themselves. For smaller company, we use Microsoft Team. Yeah? It's a collaborative tool, and there are also some, uh, and subsequently, they can go into a one-to-one -one support. Uh, that can be a Zoom, that can be a Skype, because whatever they're comfortable with, to actually do that. Again, for us, we use Microsoft Team. So this is a technology that uh, worked for us. I thought that maybe I could also share a little bit because uh, we look at different technology, right? We also have different type of uh, learning class size, different type of learning. Therefore, we assemble different type of technology to do that. So if I'm a, let's say I'm a tuition center today, I wouldn't obviously go and use an edX LMS. It's just too heavy. There's no requirement to do that, right? So, um, and, and, and a tuition center, the Microsoft team could have support everything end to end because it's such a small group. Um, but if I'm a university, clearly a Microsoft team uh, is not going to work, right? Because it's a good collaborative small group tool they don't have the ability to, at the moment anyway, that they break down the different small group within a big class. So stuff like that, I think there are little things that there are different type of version and different cost structure that enable the learner to move through it. So I want to mention a little bit about the virtual learning facilitation with AI. 
Um, IEL, uh, Eric, in fact, in fact uh, granted us uh, uh, an effort to actually develop uh, what we call a virtual mentor, right? So when they go through that pace, there are a lot of things that is changing and, and moving. And so it will be a big challenge for the learning facilitator to actually manage that, that journey. So what our learning, men, our virtual mentor do is that you would actually look at every step of the of the journey that the, the, the learner take. Let's say, for example, uh, he's supposed to go through some self-paced e-learning, go through certain PowerPoint before and video before he walk into the flip class. And if he doesn't do that, obviously he will be lost in the class, right? So we actually make sure that we know, we check, we and even when we check, he could be staying 30 minutes on the on the specific video or the specific PowerPoint. But we will know enough to say that if he have not done it, let's say, uh, four hours before the flip class start, we send him a notification. Uh, previously, we do it manually, but now our AI chatbot actually do all the alert to make sure that uh, we prepare them. And we also pick up uh, thing like if they take an MCQ, if the MCQ, they, they got it wrong. And then so we know that at a certain point of their learning journey, if they are not actually getting that type of uh, assessment doesn't fit into we will know where the problem happened so we can solve the problem for this uh, journey. So that's uh, AI. So so it's really different type of technology that we need and therefore being able to manage a sort of quite a complex journey. Uh, if you look at the learning approach, it's really a combination of asynchronous and synchronous learning that need to pull together to deliver that type of outcome that we think we intended to. So when we switch over, it was painless because there is a regulatory requirement for us uh, by SSG when we deliver blended learning. Uh, the instructor-led flip class and the group mentoring, the face-to-face -face piece, need to be done um, basically in the physical classroom. So we have to do that. But we, but all we did when we moved into a live, uh, into a virtual environment, it was just a switch into online, right? It's about taking a unified communication software to enable that streaming online. Uh, therefore, it's actually quite painless. So, so the investment in the pedagogy was really critical for us to be able to make that move without actually compromising the outcome of the learning. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie, for really enlightening us uh, with your sharing. And um, Edwin started our session by drawing the focus back to us in our role as adult educator, what kind of a mindset we need to have, um, in, even in the whole process of us moving into learning new technologies and getting comfortable with it. What Leslie has brought really aptly into our learning for this afternoon is a systemic view of introducing blended learning. And already right now, we have under our Q&A a series of different questions for Leslie, which we will take shortly. But just to recap, um, Leslie reminded us of the model that they have actually integrated using Ease. So you need to have a pedagogical model in terms of all of your blended learning design. Secondly, we see from Leslie's presentation, and what I could see is literally from moving from an individual to a virtual classroom, down to a small group coaching, down to a one-on-one -on -one support, there are carefully curated tools to really support that. So I thought that that was really good. Our next panel speaker is Dr. Ho Yi Lin, who will be adding in her expertise to really show us how we can really support learners as we go into online asynchronous learning. Yi Lin, over to you. Thank you, Brian. So a very good afternoon to everyone for taking the time to participate in the webinar today. Um, and I actually wanted to uh, echo what Edwin had said about, you know, that a lot of us are quite new to, to, to this virtual classroom learning thing. And I think um, I, and I, I totally agree with the unlearning aspect of things, right? Because for myself as well, I was really used to conducting trainings and um, teaching in, in, a, in, a, in a physical classroom where it's a lot easier to 
engage, I suppose, right, with, with your with your learners. Um, so in this time, it, it was a really big adjustment, I think, for for us as trainers and instructors and the students as well to make. So today, um, I actually thought, I don't have any slides, right, and I'm not going to focus on the technical part of it because that is definitely not my fault here. Uh, but I thought I would just take the time to discuss the process, uh, some process issues that that came up for me when I was when I was um, yeah when I was kind of converting everything into into a virtual platform. So the first point I wanted to talk about would be engagement and communication, right? Especially for adult learners, because um, I am teaching part time at SUSS, so I had the I guess the the advantage of the platform being set up for us already. Right, um, in that we are using a really standard learning platform called Canvas, for example, where you could upload um, our educational materials and resources for students. Um, and we were using, we are actually currently using Zoom as well. So, um, I, before I started teaching virtually, I was practicing a lot with Zoom. Uh, like what Amy has said as well, I was, I was just trying to fiddle. With, with all the functions and I was trying to predict what might happen um, but it doesn't go as planned right and we have to be um, quite adaptable and flexible as well but that's the later point that I'll get uh, get to so the first point about engagement and communication right is that um, when especially in times like this this is a really unprecedented time for all of us you know and and I think um, with the engagement, whenever I start a class, I would actually ask them how they're doing. Um, and especially because it just so happened that my, my lessons often are in, on Friday evenings, and that often happens just after the major announcements by the government, the Prime Minister. So I had to take some time to, to really check in with them. And um, the students that I teach, I don't know whether it's a Singaporean thing, they're really quite shy, uh, they, they don't feel like, um, they don't like to un unmic their mute, the, they don't like to unmute their microphones, or some of them also find it very uncomfortable to switch on the, the videos, which I understand because um, all of us are at home, right, and they do not want us to see, I've got, I've got students who ask me that, you know, who request that do not uh, switch on their videos because they're just uncomfortable. Right, and I think we have to respect that. That's that's the first thing, and I will actually make it a point uh, to them as well. I always invite them, right, to share as much as they can. Um, but if they can't, and if they are not willing to, then I will also uh, stop at that, right? Because the things, the, the most important for me is that they come to class, right? I can't control whether they do not turn up or not, but as long as they come to class, um, that's a good first step for me. So I would check in on them and I would actually ask them how are they doing the circuit breaker thing. Um, and they would have lots of chats. And the good thing about the chat box is that when a student starts the ball rolling and another student sees that, hey, actually, I'm also struggling with this, and they will also continue with that. And it actually helps to normalize their experiences. And I would also chip in as an instructor because I'm also at home, right? And it actually helps them to... I guess feel like you know that that, that we that they are not alone in this, right? So that's that's one thing, um, and and usually you know with engagement, um, I'm sure a lot of you will have questions about how do we track engagement, how do we retain attention, especially when the videos are not on, right? Um, so so sometimes I would find myself engaging in almost like a monologue um, and it can get quite awkward at the beginning right and what I'll do is that I will break it out I've got lots of questions for them uh, my slides are very simple not worthy at all but I would have pertinent questions and then I'll ask them so then I'll open it up. I'll just say look any of you who are comfortable you know, unmute your mics and just talk, right? If you're not comfortable, that's okay. Just put it in the chat box. So when they put it in the chat box, what happens is that I will read out the questions. Because I know that some students, they might be reading their emails or something like that, or they may not even have their chat box open. So I'll read it out. At least they can hear it. And then um, and then what I'll do is 
I would, yeah, so actually some students have fed back that they found reading out the questions really helpful. So I read out questions uh, and, and the comments that the students make, and then it, it just goes on as well. Right? Because they are encouraged, they're mutually encouraged by each other's input. Um, so another thing as well that I use is I, I do a lot of uh, breakout rooms over Zoom. Um, why is this important? Because my class size can go up to 40 learners, right? It's really hard to track the engagement. So what happens is that I break it up into a lot of smaller groups, like groups of four, for example. And then, uh, and then it kind of pushes them to engage. It, it, may be, it may be on a smaller scale, right? I'm, I will I'm not be in a room, right? unless they call me in, or I will, I will invite myself in. Um, but at least they are a bit more accountable, I suppose, to their own participation and to their own teammates. And what I do is that I'll ask them to present. So as the weeks go by, I will notice that there are quieter students. And then I would actually ask, so I would, um, for, for, for discussions, I would actually try to allocate roles uh, for some of them. And I would just tell them that it's random, but actually sometimes I would, um, intentionally give the main role to a quieter student. And so the quieter student will be asked will be asked to present. Right? So they will share the screen and they'll just present. Um, but I also but so that's why I realized that the breakout rooms are really useful um, to, to maintain their engagement. Uh, so and then of course apart from that I would have polls. I will conduct polls, I'll conduct mini quizzes, I'll use Google document, uh, documents, for example, to conduct quizzes. Um, and the, the results are live, right? So when I'm teaching a course with, with, with another of my colleague, we would actually, uh, we have got a live results, we will have live results coming in and we're like, okay, so the highest score right now is, you know, this, this a particular student from this particular group. And it kind of really just engages them. Um, might be a bit competitive, but at least their, their, their attention is there. Yeah. So, so that's what I, I, I do. Um, so quickly, right, with communication, I find that uh, with, I mean, because I've got the, I'm fortunate enough to have a standard learning platform with SUSS, uh, I would I encourage them right, to, to, to use the resources that's just given to them first. So all the readings that I have to do it, for example, before the class. Um, and in class, before every class starts, I would give frequent reminders. Uh, so, so because I'm, uh, I'm teaching undergrad, so we will have um, assignments due. I will give them frequent reminders every single seminar, and my instructions are very clear. The problem with the time like this is that a lot of us are scrambling to get our systems in place. Um, and when we have uh, developed course materials that are meant to be de delivered face to face, we have to quickly adapt to that, right? And also, of course, because as we started, so I started teaching online, I think since early March, I think, or even end Feb, I think. Um, but then there were, there were, and a lot of the assignments were group assignments. Some of them had to even go outside in the field to observe other people. And what happened was that during the circuit breaker, none of that could happen. It was a progressive circuit breaker. So there's just a lot of adaptations. Um, I, I had, you know, uh, we had to scramble and we had to adjust uh, the assignments, for example, that, okay, they, they can't go out in the community to observe people, for example, or do field trips. They would have to do it, I don't know, they might have to observe. Uh, through a video, for example, something like that, because I teach psychology, right? So, with multiple changes like this, it's very important that communication is very clear and consistent, right? So, if you're teaching with another instructor, for example, on the same course or module, that you have to make sure that yeah, all the information is the same. Because with adult learners, they have different challenges to meet, uh, they have their day-to-day -day, um, life, right, to get to. So we have to make sure that the information that we give is clear and they can, uh, they know where to find this information. So I would say it verbally and I'll make announcements, for example, I'll send out a mass email. Yeah, so that's how I communicate. Um, 
and I'll make sure that information is uploaded, for example, online in a very predictable and consistent manner every week. I will tell them that I'll an email away and I'll tell them what's my response time and I'll stick to it. Yeah. So before assignments are due, for example, um, I'll make sure that I'll, I'll tell them that I'll, I'll respond to your email individually. But what I also do is that I would, I would, I would actually collate a weekly FAQ right, for all the questions there because I also understand that in, this, in times like this, a lot of students, they can't make it to class even online. So I'll just collate the weekly FAQs and I will uh, disseminate all the questions that the students have asked into one email and I'll send it out just for the benefit of other students that couldn't make it. Yeah, because I'm, I'm always keeping in mind that the, the students, the learners are adult learners, right? They're, they're not kids. They have a lot of demands and you have to just make learning a bit easier for them. Yeah, so, um, so I guess my last point, right? is is um, being flexible adaptable and manage our expectations yeah um, of ourselves as instructors and also of our learners yeah uh, because I mean, being flexible and adaptable, adaptable I've, I've talked about it, right? We, we have to adapt to the, the ongoing crisis. We don't know what's going to happen in a month's time or two months' time or even a week's, a week's time. So we have to be quick on our feet and we have to problem solve all the time, right? So that means communication has to be clear, as I've said earlier. Flexible means, right, I have students who would uh, email me or contact me and they'll say that I um, uh, they may say that they may have trouble meeting deadlines, for example, or they may, or they may have trouble with a particular group member. And what I found out was that, for example, some group members they are actually frontline essential workers. So they may be paramedics, for example, so they're working in hospitals, right? And then I will have to um, be flexible about it. Yeah. So, so, so there's 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 a bit on that as well. And of course, manager expectations is. Um, is, is again because you know all of them are adult women, they have their own demands to manage. Uh, I will take all of that into consideration as well um, when I'm either marking them or when you know when when um, for class attendance, for example, things like that. I've got students who actually um, they actually have to leave the class halfway because they have been activated. Right. And it's on a Saturday, the class on Saturday, so they have to be active, but it can happen anytime. Yeah, so so it is about that. And also being uh, not so hard on ourselves as instructors uh, in this time. Because once we panic, uh, if it, it, it can be very difficult to problem solve and to think clearly. And the, the learners would have to depend on us to think clearly and to yeah and to be able to problem solve so if you can't do that then the, the learners might get even more anxious so i think it's, it's, it's about, about that as well um yeah so i think that's all i have today yeah before we go into the q &A. thank you thank you Eileen, for really sharing with us reminding us that in this season of transition it is important for us as adult educators to manage our own expectations. Uh, more than that, one of the biggest takeaways I've taken from Eileen's sharing is to be learner-centric. So if you recall all that she shared, um, she basically connected with the learner. So it's a good reminder for all of us to use technology. What I wrote down here is with a caring heart. That when you connect with your learners in terms of uh, their heart, they know that you care for them. Then Eileen reminded us the need for us to get into clear communication to connect with them in the mind. So um, I'm going to take the next 10 minutes to share with us uh, some of the sharings. But I think Eileen, this is the first time I'm meeting Eileen, uh, but she has literally modeled for us what Jilly Salmon talks about in terms of the five-stage model. Now, if you look into my slides here with me, one of the key things that uh, Eileen has done is connecting with the learners, talking about where they are at, motivating them and if you have Yiling as a 
lecturer or a, a facilitator, you will be naturally drawn into this learning experience. So one of the key things we need to be always be very, very mindful is we have different profiles of adult learners. Some of them may not even know how to gain access. And therefore, during this process in time, whether it's through email, through WhatsApp group, or through different ways, we want to motivate them. And we want to make sure that they can find access into the learning platforms. If you stay on with me, and what Elaine literally did was to create a sense of a community among the group of learners. Now, what SUSS has as an advantage is most of the time the classes are over a stretch of possibly months or weeks. But for a lot of us within the CET setting, sometimes some of our classes are within there about maybe just two days or three days. And therefore, we need to maximize the opportunity for us to really have them come together as a community to support each other in the process of using technology. Now, uh, in the whole essence of us getting learners would be pushing down some form of information. And there, sometimes what we need to do is keep our content bite size. During this stage, there are lots of questions that have come in earlier talking about how long should a virtual training session be. Now, ideally, in the context of a webinar, we normally keep it to about one hour, one hour, one and a half hours, or one hour, 45 minutes. Because typically, there is little interaction except for you typing your questions. But if you're converting it into a virtual training session, uh, you can stretch it to a three hours, which I'll share later. This just past Monday, I was meeting with a group of different HR representatives in an oil and gas organization from at least there are about six different countries. As a result of COVID-19, they are wanting to find ways how they can support their employees uh, to manage stress better. So one of the things that we had to do was uh, when, when they came in, um, the HR directors, when they interfaced with me, they were worried saying, Brian, we don't want you to just download content for one hour, two hours, or even three hours because we will not be able to engage the learners, especially when they are logging in from different countries with different backgrounds. So one of the key stages that we do under stage three is to make sure that our content is bite size, And more than just keeping your content bite size, maybe there are about 10 to 15 minutes of presentation, but what Eileen has reminded us is to utilize all of the different features within the uh, video conferencing platforms, from audio down to video, down to chat, down to the non-verbal feedback, down to poll, to literally increase the engagement with your learners. And one of the key things that we often would do um, in facilitating online learning is stage four, where there is knowledge constructions. Similarly for us, when I do a full seven hours workshop using Zoom, one of the key things we have to remind ourselves is to utilize and maximize the use of breakout rooms for learners to come together in groups of two, sometimes groups of three, four, or even five, depending on the size of your overall class. All right. So stage four talks about the whole essence that we need to come together to allow them to do a bit of a collaboration where there is a sharing of ideas, there is peer learning, and that way it will literally motivate them. And the last stage that Julie Salmon typically encourage us is to look into the whole essence of development, where we as facilitators, not only do we need to provide technical support through all of the five stages, but one of the key things is to really remind us that we need to do online moderation to create a sense of community and at the last stage, here we're looking into what is the biggest takeaway. Lastly, reminded us that the learning model has got to translate into application back into the workplace. And this is where for us as facilitators, we want to choose right activities to encourage them to think about the transfer of learning back into their work environment. And I, I just want to move on to the next segment of my sharing, highlighting that Whichever video conferencing platform you use, these are all of the nine different basic features. Of course, it depends on whether yours is a paid version or a free, uh, subscri a free subscription or a paid subscription. But what I want to remind us is this. We can literally utilize all of the basic features to push our learners up which way and allow me to just maybe just uh, show you that 
we do not want learners to just be passively listening to us. We want to move them into the next stage. And this uh, framework comes from Chi as well as Wiley in 2014 that talks about in the process of your virtual training, you want to assign different instructional methods to get them to manipulate. It could be as simple as clicking, participating in a quiz or in a poll. So typically for me, I utilize a range of from uh, um, Google Forms down to Mentimeter, down to um, Kahoot. We've experimented with Kahoot before, as well as Queasy and the different platforms, getting them to do something, all right? But what we want to do is sometimes we will get them to take notes while we are doing the presentation. And this is where I often like to use the whiteboard function within any video conferencing platforms to allow them to create, to allow them to literally generate, not just to regurgitate what they have learned, but to summarize it, paraphrase it in their own words, maybe create a mind map. And this is where sometimes I will allow my learners to use Padlet and most of the time, we want to move them into the final stage, that of interactive, being having lots of interaction. And for me, um, in IAL, we're using Canvas as well as Zoom as the main standard platforms. But for a lot of us, we integrate with the different platforms that we are comfortable with. But the essence is to drive them, um, moving them away from being passive, moving into active, constructive, as well as uh, interactive and at this point in time I want to bring my sharing back to my final point which is my observation um, as we move into the whole essence of circuit breaker and we have no choice but to really convert into fully online synchronous learning now Leslie already had the benefits for a lot of us because this entire curriculum is designed on a blended that takes place what we call a consideration between asynchronous and synchronous. But for a lot of the institution, it has primarily been designed within the context of a face-to-face -face class. And therefore, if we were to switch it into an asynchronous, uh, the, we may not have the turnaround time to be able to do that. But, you know, in this whole process of transition, one of the key things that have reminded me is basically TPAC. And allow me to share my screen with you. For me, a lot of us as adult educators, we have the content knowledge that is represented by the blue circle. We are great instructors and therefore we come up with case studies, demonstration, role play, brainstorming, jigsaw learning, um, or even games. And that is represented by the yellow box, which is yellow circle, which is pedagogy. But for a lot of us like Edwin and even Yiling have aptly reminded us, it is stepping out from our comfort zone to use the ping dimension, which is the technological knowledge to use the video conferencing platforms. And for us, you know, Leslie had the advantage of using the LMS to push out the content. So technological uh, knowledge pushing out content, which is uh, blue, that is done very easily. And he has got a platform of using maybe his WebEx technological knowledge with pedagogy, pushing out instructions, bite-sized learning. But for a lot of us, I think what is critical in this season of transition is to really examine the ping dimension and to ask ourselves not to be too hard on ourselves. And as you try out online learning, I want you to know that my biggest learning came from making lots of mistakes to really work on a different transition. And over this past there are about um, two weeks, I've done three sessions of training the trainers on the usage of Zoom. I've done about nine sessions training learners within IAL. We're looking into hundreds of them, nine sessions. And we're looking into learners ranging from as young as in their 20s to as old as in their 60s or even close to 70s. And the following four quadrants represents my reflection during this season in time. So if you look into the vertical um, line, on the upper side, we're talking about your ability or your exposure in using high technology, high ability in using tech tools for learning. Uh, on the bottom will be low abilities or low exposure or low expertise in using technology tools, even in your face-to-face -face learning. The horizontal session talks about on my right, your ability to use a video conferencing platforms. On my left, basically we're looking into low exposure to the use of video conferencing platforms. And I have four quadrants. 
So if you look onto the first one, is high ability in using tech tools, low ability in using Zoom. So on the right side, this is the ideal. We all know how to use tech tools. We know how to use video conferencing platforms, and you can just uh, turn a face to face into a fully online session. But we must also be mindful that there are learners who have no exposure to tech tools and no exposure to Zoom, the usage of Zoom. And this is the category that I've put as rates because we need to pay careful attention to a lot of them. And finally, we have trainers or even learners who know how to use video conferencing platforms because they use that a lot at work, but low exposure pertaining to tech tools. So allow me to just illustrate. So whether you are a trainer or a learner, on the right side, if you are a high tech tool user, you know how to use Zoom, Basically, if you are a trainer, you saw, you fly, and you enjoy the online learning session. If the learners are on the green side, they can participate very actively in your session with no difficulty at all. And this is the first group that we want to tap on, finding trainers who are strong in this to mentor the rest of the trainers in your institution, or for that matter, finding learners who are in the category, what I call fly, the abil ability to soar, to really help out with the rest of the learners who are slightly slower. The second profile talks about the two aspects. And in my four years of training learners as well as trainers in the use of tech tools or video conferencing, on the right side, that of uh, being able to hop, if you're already using tech tools as a trainer, you have low exposure to Zoom, getting to it is a matter of giving you cheat sheet, giving you some pointers and um, maybe some demonstration, and very quickly you can get into the mode of jumping or hopping. Then on the bottom left side, low tech, high Zoom talks about, you know what, I can use video conferencing, I do not need to use other tech tools like Pole Everywhere, Mentimeter, or even Nearport, I can effectively uh, so-called create an active session of learning using slides, using all of the platforms within video conferencing. So these are the individuals, if you give them some handles, they can quickly participate. So this I call as category two. But in my transition to help learners begin to um, stay on and join us and not lose them in online learning, these are the learners who are slowly walking. And in order for them to walk faster or to progress from walking to running, walking to jogging, walking to uh, jumping, or even walking to soaring, we have to be very, very mindful. And I want to end my session here that typically when I do my training, I normally scaffold the introduction of technology tools. Because if you introduce it too fast, it will overwhelm your learners. So thank you very much for taking time to be with us. At this point right now, uh, we have a series of many different questions. And allow me maybe to just read out the questions. So panelists, I'd like you to click on Q&A. There is a question by Raymond at 4.15. And I would like to direct this to Leslie and Elin and Edwin Fufin to chip in as well. Is using one platform the best practice and then from there to scale up? And the, the question is because some platforms might not be sufficient to deal with the complexity of addressing different corporate training and operational needs. So maybe, lastly, you want to take this live and then the rest of the panelists, we can contribute as well. Come. Lastly, we're going to request for you to unmute your mic. Mm. There are three categories of user here, depending on your size. Um, if you are a training center, tuition center, I think Microsoft would do all the job. Microsoft is team is more than just a communication platform. In fact, they have a, a portion that actually allow you to have almost like um, uh, LMS, a small limited LMS that allow you to store your content as well. And so so that's one element, but if you are mid-size, let's say, right, I think Microsoft can still do it, or you might have to go WebEx, but WebEx is a part of it, right? It doesn't actually do everything. Uh, you might need to combine with Google Classroom, right? Uh, the homeschooling 
I was primary school, they are using um, um, that, right? If you're if you're some small mid size, of course you're big. Uh, you do what we've been doing, right? Uh, the, using the the big system like edX, LMS, and all that sort of thing. Okay, thank you, Leslie. What about Edwin and Yiling? Would you like to chip in on this question? Yeah, so I think uh, I'll, I'll speak from the perspective of an independent consultant. Um, I think while I mentioned earlier on that it is important to get started with one platform and kind of like make full use and learn all the tips and tricks of that platform, uh, what Brian shared earlier on, uh, I think the second last slide, uh, you know, the nine, you know, polling chats, everything. I, I found that with most of the more uh, promising and, and up-to-date conferencing tools, they are all able to do that. So I think if you can be comfortable with one, then as an independent consultant, you need to be flexible, just like Yiling has mentioned. You need to be flexible if your client, like for example, I'm going to do a session on Monday. I'm so used to Zoom. Um, and now they say, you know, sorry, we, we don't want to use Zoom. We are using WebEx. So I'm arranging a tech session tomorrow in the morning to just run through with them. And I've just posed a couple of questions to their tech guys as well. Can, can you do this? Can you do that? And my guess is that most of the conferencing tools would have uh, some of these basic features already in place. All right. So uh, for independent consultants, unfortunately, you would not... I think you need to be flexible. You can't be just held hostage by one platform. You need to learn what these features do in a platform, what it does, what it can do, and then subsequently you just have to learn how to transpose this with the different platforms. Now, other than um, uh, the conferencing part, I think also many of the panelists have spoken. You heard names like Menti, Google Form, uh, Kahoot, Quizzy. Uh, you have to go out there and try. You you have to get on. Um, onto all those platforms to just go and experience it, create a free account, try it, uh, and, you, and and then see how the applicability, right? How you can apply it to your your your, your learning. So that that's, that would be my sense. You need to be flexible. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Edwin. What about Evelyn? Would you like to comment on that? Uh, I think I think both Edwin and Leslie has 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 kind of summed up quite well. Um, I only have one thing that I can think of is. To, to really think about the objective, uh. because the thing is because you know that there's just so many different choices that we have out there, and it can get quite overwhelming, right? You're choosing the right platform, uh, but it is about just understanding what exactly do you want to do, right? So even with polling, with online polling uh, options, there there are many many different types of Mentimeter and things like that. So so if if you've just selected one to just try it out and then you think that, yeah, this is okay for now, then I think it's, it's good to go. But again, your needs might change, right? So it's, it's good to take that into consideration, yeah. Right. Thank you, Yiling, to, uh, for reminding us that pedagogy drives technology. So it's important for us to do that, all right? There is a question in the same vein by Brian at 4.24. Uh, for technology, do you recommend only using a web conferencing tool in a live session, example, Zoom only, or would you have two technologies in use at the same time, web conference plus LMS? So we're going to address this question live. Panelists, anyone want to add on? So maybe, maybe I'll, 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 I'll take a shot. Um, now, as an independent, and we deal mostly with adults, right? Uh, and I don't run a training center, so I'm more looking at what the organization needs. So in most of my application, I don't need an LMS, right? I At least for what I'm uh, working with right now. But I think if you are just thinking about as an independent and you want to be tied to a platform, I think you need to keep your options very open. Let me give you an example. I'm now working on a potential project where to convert a existing program which involves role play all right so a lot of us in soft skills we do role play right which is one-on-one -on -one. and so this question was posed to me um how do you do role play with a class of 12 right so if you're familiar with zoom the first idea you come up with let's create six virtual rooms breakout rooms right put them into the different uh breakout rooms pair them up and they can do their role play which is wonderful uh but then i i i started thinking right i mean it's a uh, 
four half day sessions. If every time I do role play, it's going to be a virtual breakout. After a while, it can be quite um, you know the the novelty is gone. Can I get them to use their WhatsApp video, right? Just uh, have a WhatsApp video. Let's let's do a role play like this, right? Uh, can it work? I mean, we're all at home. We have free access to Wi-Fi. Why not? So I think it's it's really about being comfortable with exploring tools that you are already using, right? There are many many free tools, and I always think that you know WhatsApp is a great. Uh, uh, I mean, just just so you know, right? Uh, as a panelist, we also have a WhatsApp chat group that's happening right now in the background, that's supporting us in this live event. So you got to think of. The different ways that you can use the existing systems and applications that can support you in your in, in, in the work that you do. All right. Thank you, Edwin, for adding on. Um, uh, Leslie, would you like to comment? If just in case you hear somebody shouting, it would be my wife. Right? She's been completely stressed out uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, my kid go through tuition and obviously homeschooling as well. Um, so, and many of these provider actually they are really quite lack of a lot of this capability to deliver because it's their first time that they have to do that type of synchronous learning. Um, and most of them don't actually have the right tool. You actually need two things, right? Um, many of them actually have the communication. You just take a Zoom, you can do that. But the stress doesn't come from that. Actually, the stress comes from when I have to submit my assignment, I have to PDF my... my, my <clears throat> my document the kid is having. So the parent really is out there, uh, really going through tremendous amount of uh, photocopying, PDF, and put them in, and it all got lost. These are really the portion of the learning journey. It's not just impacting the kid, but it's impacting the parents. So therefore, the, the needs for most training, right, other than, I guess, training that, is short, but you really do need that combination of not just a communication platform, a sort of LMS, right? Whether no matter how small that is, that enable that support uh, in terms of uh, the assignment, the, the the contents, the storage retriever, and storing for assessment and all that sort of thing. All right, thank you, Leslie. The tool must provide you both and to be able to support that type of uh, learning experience. Thank you for reminding us, all right. The key thing I think uh, takeaway would be being mindful of the learning journey or the learning experience we desire our learners to go through, then from there within the constraints of the organization, curate the best resources. We have a series of questions for Dr. Ho. Uh, first question by Albert at 443. Uh, how much do you have to condense your content for virtual delivery? For example, 20% of the original content, um, dash only the must know. We're going to answer this question live. So, Dr. Ho? Um, no, I think, I think that's a good question. So, what I would do is um, that there is no fixed percentage as to how I would, uh, as to how much I would condense. I would actually kind of draw out the main point. So of course, you know, in in a in a structured training program, there are always objectives, right? And every seminar or every se training session, you have an objective, the learning objectives. So for me, I would just peg it on that, um, and I'll make sure that the learning objectives are met. So, uh. If they are, but of course, um, as long so, so what, what I'm saying is that there's some information that you can actually ask them to read offline before the training session, right? Um, but there is a chance, there's a good chance that a lot of your adult learners will not have time to read that offline, yeah. So what I do is, um, for the offline resources, if there are some, if there are a couple of pertinent points that I that I think I need to drive through, I will actually summarize it, um, and I'll just put it in the PowerPoint slide. But I will not show the answers first. Yeah, so I'll just I'll just I'll just create a question around those, um, in, in, in information, and I'll and I'll create a discussion out of it, right? And then of course, then after that, they'll they will discuss about it, and then I will just summarize it. Uh. I'll show them the summary of the points that I've made. 
Um, so that's kind of like condensed version. Um, and yeah, I think I think that's that's what I can think of right now. Okay, thank you so much. What about Edwin and Leslie? So we started, uh, the, our standard three, four years back was 40 hours. I think most of us do for academic courses or lifelong learning courses, it's about 40 hours, but that's 100% face to face. So after we changed our pedagogy, it actually ended up 60 hours, but this 60 hours is divided between 20 hours face to um, live, not necessarily face to face live, 20 hours on, um, on the e-learning. The other 20 hours is actually assignment and lab. Right. So when it so so when we lay this out across the learning journey, uh, the question was: Should I condense that that virtual learning? I'm assuming the question is: Should I condense it for face for life delivery? So obviously we expect them to already learn uh, before they come to the flip class. During the flip class, we spend very little time just to summarize the concept. And then we actually go into flip class where we spend all the time internalizing application of that knowledge through this flip class peer-to-peer -peer learning. So yes, definitely uh, the virtual learning side of the delivery would have been substituted by the e-learning anyway. All our, our content would be recorded because we are talking about the same thing over and over again. Let's get it done in the video. But let's summarize them just in case there are learners that who have not went through that, that learning. Then they can go into flip class to really internalize that knowledge. Good. Um, um, since Leslie, you're on this, um, there are some questions uh, for you. Uh, perhaps let's take a look. What AI chatbot is Leeton using? Is it commercially available? Um, okay. So, um, yeah, so we, uh, with IAL support, um, we actually got some grants to develop this. So we use, um, so, so we have, uh, we just wrote it out uh, just recently and we promised IAL, in fact, it's good that you asked this question, that we'll make this tool available to uh, education institutions in Singapore who want to use it. It's almost like open source. Obviously, you won't own the IP. Uh, we get a vendor to actually allow any of the education institution to actually use this virtual mentor. If you want to, of course, they they would have to charge the service to to support the implementation in your organization. Right. Thank you so much. We have a question from Min Li Chin at four fifty one, and the questions I believe all of us can but this um contribute in this. I have clients even from large organizations, especially in Malaysia and Indonesia, who have had unfavorable experience of virtual learning, or who has a culture that does not support virtual training and learning. Can you share any tips on how to convince and persuade them to change their view on the effectiveness of virtual training? Panelists, anyone want to get started? Or perhaps maybe lastly, you can add on, there was a question earlier, what is a flipped classroom? And allow me to comment. Flip classroom, basically, we push up the content for them to read on their own before they come into the online sessions or face-to-face -face session uh, for clarification where the time is allocated for more hands-on practice. So it requires what we call a shift in terms of mindset. So maybe lastly, you want to share with that? How did you convince, how did you bring about some shift in terms of mindset? Actually, as a, as a company, a Little Academy, a mission has been trying to, how do we get learning to happen virtually, digitally, right? So that's why we transform, we deliver that learning pedagogy, we go to the market. Um, it has not been easy. Obviously, we need to, if you look at what I was just talking about, the, we have to learning, we have to deliver learning outcome. That's why the 60 hours is about how do I actually mentor and personally mentor you as a learner and to be able to deliver tangible utilization of the skill that gives you that learning outcome, right? So I think that's one way because we all know that SME do not want to send their people for training, but if you can deliver the outcome, they would then come, right? So when they come through, we obviously have to tell them to cross the line to say that some of the learning have to be uh, 
uh, online, right? So it has always been a challenge, but I'm so glad even today, right? I mean, I'm just presently surprised that this particular event, if you look at the title, right? So generally, you probably end up, I don't know, 50, 80 people attending. I'm really surprised and uh, there are really 500 people registering it. And our own experience as well, right? Uh, uh, since uh, the COVID-19 came on board, uh, we, we do do monthly seminar, right? We invite SME to come in. And clearly, uh, although we are promoting e-learning, but such an event, we would have to we would be concerned to do a webinar rather than a, a, a seminar. But so we make the decision. In fact, the, the attendant didn't drop. In fact, it's better, just like today's, right? And the attendant is high is because it's no longer a choice, right? In fact, I think the convenience that allowed people to come on board of, for this webinar is partly also what draws so many people to come through. So I think it's a change of mindset, even, I mean, a vendor like ourselves who want, uh, have to change that mindset. And now it's no longer a question of, actually, should I, if I'm inviting you to come into a webinar or a, a online training, I should really be trying to convince you because it's almost like apologizing, right? that actually you should come on e-learning. So, so now it's actually you should be apologizing if you are actually trying to deliver it face to face because you put everybody at risk. So it's given. I think that's a, the norm. That's a future, right? By the time this is over, really, when we set up a meeting, set up a, a, a talk to deliver a thing, I think the first thing we come through is let's have a webinar let's have a web call. I think that will be the standard. That's right. Um, Edwin, Dr. Ho, Eileen, anything to add on to this segment in terms of shifting mindsets? Um, I think, I think for me is, when I, when I read that excerpt, the question, my first question is, why, why was it an unfavorable experience? Right? So it's really to get an understanding as to what kind of experience did they have? Um, the second question that I think of uh, is that do they have access to devices, for example? Yeah, what kind of network do they have that's running? Uh, so, because a lot of for, for, for a lot of us, we we don't have to think about these kind of things, right? We we have really access to a lot of devices, a lot of uh, platforms uh, on the internet and things like that. And yeah, so that's that's my um, there are the two considerations that I have to, to get that I have because if we know why it is unfavorable, then at least we know how to target and how to problem solve. Because the one thing that you want to, the, the, the main thing to convince or persuade people and to help them become motivated is that you, you really find out what the source of problem or the source of concern or worry is. You have to make sure that it works for them. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's that's what I think. All right, thank you so much, Edwin. What about you? Yeah, I, I came from Telco many years ago, um, and I think that one of the things that uh, you know is an obstacle for you know learners from these countries that you know uh, the, the the person who asked this question remains that you know if they don't have access to proper broadband. Um, it's that's it. It's something that, like Doctor Ho says, you know, it's something we take for granted. I mean, we turn on our Wi-Fi; it's it's there. But you know, in my sessions, I've I've got participants from Philippines, uh, Indonesia. They would they would just say, "I'm sorry, I can't turn on my video." And you, when you probe a little bit further, they'll say, "My my internet's unstable." And and you can then validate that because subsequently their audio is also kind of like you know really choppy. So I think. Um, you know, to, to other than mindset, we also need to think about the platforms that they I mean, the infrastructure that they have, whether they can support uh, virtual or online learning. Yeah. Thank you, Edwin. Um, this past Monday, my participants came from uh, China, um, Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, as well as Singapore. And the reality is true, literally, in some places within Indonesia as well as uh, Thailand, we had a number of the participants who had multiple issues due to the internet infrastructure. So these are things that we have to be very mindful of. But 
I want to draw us back into this. If we can create a positive online learning experience via what we call a synchronous session, that positive experience will stay in the mind of institution. And to me, I see COVID-19 as an opportune time to bring about a shift in terms of how we um, facilitate our learning in the future. Now, I'm mindful of time. Five, currently, we are 5.22 right now. We have a series of 72 questions. I'm not sure whether we are able to address them, but I'm going to just collapse some of the questions together. There are lots of questions pertaining to how long should a online synchronous session be? So I'm going to open this up to all of the panelists for you to grant your uh, contribution. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I take 90 minutes per session as a, so it's like a, um, in my lesson plan, right? So, so it's uh, worked around 90 minutes and then you give them a break, right? And then followed by another 90 minutes and then that's, that's, that's like half a day. So that works uh, most of the time. Um, I've sat in sessions where it's seven hours, all right? So you just have to be very creative around how to make sessions come alive in seven hours. Not, not going to be easy. So longer breaks, um, you may need to intersperse your uh, session planning with things like, i give you an example. Instead of watching a video together, why don't we incorporate a break? and giving them that link or that video file or the YouTube link and tell them in 30 minutes time, we're going to come back after the break. But in, within this 30 minutes, please manage your time, right? Watch this YouTube video or watch this 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 uh, file that I'm sending to you. And then when you come back, be ready to answer these three questions. So we, if you add in things like that, then, you know, that seven hours, uh, you, you can you, you, technically you can stretch it a little bit longer. Yeah. So I, I would take 90 minutes as a, as a block to start and then you build it up from there. All right, thank you. And the rest of the panelists? Um, am I mute? Sorry. We can hear you. Um, could you unmute your mic, Leslie? Leslie, we'll need you to unmute your mic. Okay, okay. Yes, sorry. we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, actually we have this thing called a virtual bootcamp, a virtual campus. And in fact, the student actually do a full day, 9 to 6 o'clock, just like when they go to work, because of our, of our learning pedagogy, there will be session that we deliver. It's an instructor-led training. Obviously, like Edwin say, it cannot be more than 30 minutes, 90 minutes listening to the same person uh, talking, right? The same person. So, but there are different things that they do during the day. Uh, they might be going to a small group mentoring. They could be just going out, sitting by the side, do their homework. And but when they do the homework, they need the support. So, but we connect them throughout. Actually, it's almost like you're walking into a physical classroom. Just that you are you, you might be in the different side of the window, and everybody know what everybody is doing. Just like I mean, what we are saying, right? If I have five people, I know what everybody is doing. So, and we turn that on for for eight hours, right? So that. They can talk to anybody and the facilitator can actually go into this five group and intervene at any one time. So the LMS actually support that with the right type of technology. You can actually have a whole synchronous learning happening eight hours a day, right? Um, as you as you move through. Dr. Ho, anything to add on? Um, I mean, I, I agree. I think as long as we have got, we have got a break. So I also do it in 90 minute slots and then I'll have a break and then 90 minutes. But within the 90 minutes, they can have mini breaks as well. So, so like what Amy had shared, I, I also did the same thing. I would actually give them a link to an article, a news article or a video and I would just tell them, you know, please spend some time to read them. Right in your breakout rooms, uh, and discuss. We'll come back to the main room, and I'll close the main room in, in thirty minutes. Yeah, so so they have some wiggle room to be flexible, and I think that kind of gives them some mental. It's like it's like a it's like break like, like a bit of a hit space for them. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Here in IL, um, our training classes are now seven hours. So with the mandated cancellation of face-to-face -face class, we are actually converting our face-to-face -face class into fully online. 
um, a lot of there are lots of questions asking about assessment related uh, stuff pertaining to SSG and WSQ related. I don't think within the context of our session here we can address that. But typically for me, I give them a stretch break after every hour. And sometimes getting them to stand up, stretch a little bit is going to be very important. Currently, all of you have uh, sat down, listened to us for one and a half hours, and that's quite okay for a webinar because it's a huge platform. But if you're attending a full day training, at the end of seven hours, you're going to have your neck uh, ache, back ache, shoulder ache, and everywhere will be painful. So it's very important for us to be mindful of the ergonomics setup required to facilitate a fully online learn. Thank you. Now we have a series of uh, some more questions. Um, now let me just attend to them. Edwin, Leslie, is there something else that you want to um, address? Yeah, I'm uh, looking at a couple of, uh, uh, I, I suppose they are independent just like me and they're asking this question. Uh, after COVID-19, will our live classroom sessions come back? I, like I said, I hope they come back. Uh, but I think we may have to be prepared that uh, once learners embrace technology, and I tell you, the younger ones are, are embracing technology, right? Um, we may have to be prepared that uh, a portion of our work may have to shift online and virtual. And I, and I look at it positively as well. Uh, one of the things is that what you used to be, un, you know, you can't do because you are physically in Singapore, you can't be in Philippines or in Vietnam doing another, another workshop now becomes possible. So, so look at it positively. Uh, it can open up a lot of opportunities for us as independent. So I'm afraid, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether live sessions would come back or will it stay this way, but I'm thinking that we may have to be prepared. Okay, thank you so much. There is a series of general questions on how do we um, handle assessment. So can I direct mm -hmm. the question to Yilin? Uh, there is a question by Albert that says, how do you conduct assessment in a context? How, how do you go about assessing your learners? And then later on, we're going to have Leslie and Edwin to add on. So, um, I, okay, so because I am part of SUSS and then we do have our standard ways of assessing adult learners. Uh, so what we do is, but for Adult learners, we try to make it a bit more application based. Um, and in psychology, I, I'm not sure uh, um, a few of you know, it's, it's just a lot of writing. It's a lot of reading, there's a lot of writing of essays. Um, and for the, the particular course that I just finished teaching, we actually changed it. So there's no more writing. Uh, we asked them to um, create. Uh, posters, for example, right, to consolidate whatever they have learned and apply it on the field. Yeah, so that actually helps them to retain it a lot better. So what I've, uh, so then that's one part. Another type of assessment that, I'll, that, that, that I've tried is um, for them to film a video, so like a five minute video using an iPhone. Again, this is also about um, applying the knowledge that they've learned, right? Um, and it also actually makes the discussion during live sessions a bit more livelier, yeah. So, so, so I will make sure that everything is kind of linked and tied to, to that. Um, and I would also, I mean, another way to find out whether they have retained their knowledge and it's also part of the assessment is that at the end of the course, I will ask them to write a reflection piece. Yeah, and that was when I realized that the hands-on type of assessments really worked. So they would tell me that the, the main points that they've taken away from the course. They have actually, they, they, they have also um, started reading the external resources that were available to them. Yeah, so I'm not sure whether that, that plays a part in that. Um, but I guess it, it was a really like a, it's like a multimedia type of of assessment, I suppose, as compared to just submitting essays. Um, yeah, so for SUSS, the assessments, there are like two assessments and then one, and of course, assessment on an exam. Uh, so it's quite straightforward. Uh, but in between, you can always throw in a few quizzes here and there, surprise quizzes. 
uh, make it fun, make it competitive. Um, yeah, so I think I think that's that's it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Leslie. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, we have two types of assessment. Uh, for Singapore, uh, before the COVID-19, uh, we have to do physical assessment uh, at, our, uh, at our class. Uh, after that, SHG allowed us to do virtual assessment. Uh, all our assessment are really project brief. So um, therefore, we only really need to record the interview. Uh, and obviously, the the project brief would be given to us, so we do the interview. So the overseas is slightly different because we deliver some academic program, right? So these are young kid, uh, university kid. Uh, so we use uh, obviously they take exam. Um, so we use uh, Proctor technology. So let's say you you when a person. Uh, his eyes going sideways, maybe he got a piece of paper next to him. And when you do that, you can actually catch it, right? So so, so really is just just putting a camera right in front of them and make sure that they are really uh, being recorded and, uh, and same like no different when you are in the classroom to make sure that they're not cheating, they're not uh, having a piece of paper next to their table and you can sort of catch that with the with the technology as well. All right, thank you so much. I guess the key essence is to look into the nature of the learning outcomes, whether it's a cognitive, effective, or psychomodal, more skills phase, and to think within the setting of using Zoom or video conferencing, can the skills-based assessment still continue? We're gonna allow Ron, uh, so can I call on the admin team to perhaps unmute Ron's um, microphone? Uh, Ron, would you unmute your microphone and we're going to have you maybe share with us your question. So Ron, are you there? We need you to unmute yourself. We're not getting any signal. Yes. Hello. Yes, Ron, we can hear you. Please hi. proceed. Okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Can you repeat your questions? I, I, I'm actually... No. Note, you, noting some stuff. Okay, you were raising your hands, and we believe that you have a question for the panelists. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry, sorry, no, uh, it's uh, uh, error. Sorry. Okay, no worries about that. So, could <laughs> yeah, we sorry. have maybe ML Yo? Uh, there is an ML Yo who raised your hand. Um, we're gonna unmute your mind. Do you have a question for us? ML Yo, are we able to hear from you? If not, can we maybe? Uh, unmute Dr. Rex. Yep. Hi, Rex. Yes, hi. Excellent facilitation there. Thank you. Brian. Yes, I have a question for Leslie, which I posted in the Q&A. Not sure why it didn't get through. So, question for Leslie. So, referring to your last slide, the virtual learning facilitation with AI, where you show us the four-stage process, was hoping that you could uh, elaborate for us on the AI portion. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. So so the AI engine, uh, essentially we are trying to manage that learning journey. And with all the data that we curate during that learning journey, and ultimately the goal is how can we actually get more people cross the line with a learning outcome that we want, right? That's ultimately what we want to do. Given the learning journey is actually quite, is, is spread across different locations, spread across different trainer. So it's going to be a real challenge. Nobody is really watching the along the way, the level of skills that they are acquiring. So um, so we, we will be able to, first of all, are they do, doing what they need to do, um, prescribed to them on the lesson plan? If you have to read, a video before you come to flip class did you do that so these are the motivational aspects so this is really about alerting them over time that's one aspect of the analytic that when we see that they didn't do that then we have this chat bot that basically interact with them that advise them that they should actually go and read because it's time is coming up right so that's one part so across the entire journey you have many 
a milestone that we check to make sure that uh, they are motivated, they are following the, the learning, and learning actually happens. So there are a lot of statistics that inside your LMS. That's why you have to have a good LMS. The LMS will be tracking everything that is going on from how much time they spend reading to how long they spend reading. So based on this step, we'll be able to make sure that we, we prompt them. If they are falling behind, we'll know it, right? That's an alert. The second part is that along the way, you want to measure their skill acquisition at what stage they actually acquire the skill, right? So we have different things for this assessment. Uh, it could be an MCQ, right? So if they go through the MCQ and they are weak in certain area of the MCQ because they try six times answering the same question, they get it wrong, they probably tikam tikam, right? So we will sort of know it. So based on that, and when it come to the class, and when they do the assessment, we'll be able to know, actually, he's falling behind, is it because that he didn't spend enough time following reading, or he's just missed out on certain part so that we can try to fill that gap. So the, the virtual mentor that we have is supposed to, not just to manage the learning, learning journey, and with all the steps, because we have different stakeholders involved in supporting this learner through that collaborative learning. So, so this step also will help, right? If I'm an instructor, I'm supposed to pass certain concept to this individual and that person don't actually get that concept and then he move into a mentoring with a specific mentor and then there's a gap if he's not ready so at least the mentor would know whether he's ready for that project, right? So all those things, all those, so there's a lot of data essentially. So it's almost a data science project, but the AI piece is really the chatbot that enable us to action uh, at the right time of the journey. Thank you, Leslie, for sharing with us. I'm mindful of time. We've gone nine minutes past our time. So thank you once again for all of your keen participation and uh, coming alongside with us. Over to you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you very much for a great panel discussion to all the panel speakers, Edwin, Leslie, uh, Yiling, Brian, fantastic uh, insights and sharing. Uh, to all the attendees who joined us, I think we, at one point we had about 400, over 400 attendees. Um, tuning in. Uh, great questions. Uh, we will follow up with these questions uh, after this session. Um, we have set up a Padlet platform. Uh, we will send the link of the Padlet uh, platform to all the attendees uh, and we can carry on the discussion from there. Um, and maybe basically to sum up the key takeaways for me, uh, there's so much uh, rich discussion um, for the AEs. Um, have a beginner's mindset to learn to navigate in the virtual space. Be comfortable with technology, experiment, try and learn together. Um, when rejigging the pedagogy, have the outcome in mind. Uh, what is the business goal? And uh, having different combinations of faculty to support the learning process. Uh, continuously check with your learners where they are and with concern and compassion. Break down the content into bite-sized uh, learning content bits um, and support your learners in small groups. Um, encourage peer support in chat groups and in chat boxes. Uh, have lots of activities for your learners online, uh, polls, short quizzes, live results. Uh, manage our expectations of our learners and also uh, of ourselves as trainers you know, as we begin on this, on this uh, transition journey. Um, and Brian's great sharing from passive receiving of info to active manipulation of information, uh, generating and reconstructing that information and then encouraging interactive dialogue uh, amongst your learners. Um, and um, being mindful that different learners uh, have different te technology uh, proficiency levels. So uh, being patient and being aware and mindful of this. And um, Simple things like digital literacy, you know, e-filing techniques, using cloud storage, uploading, um, all these, not all of us are at the same level, so being uh, cognizant of that. Um, so once again, uh, great thanks and appreciation to our panel speakers. Um, we have we've come to the close. Uh, 
I, I don't know whether panel speakers would like to have a closing message or a one two sentence. You know, your 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 key message to our community out there. Yeah. Um, yeah, Edwin. Uh, have the growth mindset. Yeah. Uh, be ready to embrace the change. Uh, and uh, I forgot to mention this. Um, I type in the answer somewhere. Have a meeting manager support you. Don't do this by yourself, right? So focus on the learner and have all the file sending, creating of polls, breakout groups, right? Have someone else. I have someone else seated beside me to do that. So have a meeting manager to support you. Take that load off you. Focus on the learner. Uh, have the growth mindset. I think you should be on your way. Yeah. Um, thanks, Cross that line. <laughs> Many edu adult educators are still, I think, uh, they are always this thing about, I think it's more effective training face-to-face, -face, but I think time has come that really is not a choice anymore. We need to deliver and we need to deliver as just effectively virtually um, uh, compared to face-to-face. -to -face. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I, think, I think my last, my last comment would be just remember that there are many, many, many of us in the same situation as, as you are. Um, and don't, don't be afraid to try and make mistakes. Yeah, that's how we learn. Great. Thank you, Yuling. For me, three words, support, support, and support. I think to support our adult educators, to support our learners through this season of transition, support is important body soul and spirit thank you fantastic awesome okay thank you we've come to the end of this session um do take care keep healthy uh great thank you to our uh colleagues in the healthcare sector keep up the good fight uh be mindful of rest and um take care everybody see you again soon take care cheers thank you thank you